Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is the Church, the Church of Jesus Christ. And in particular, we're concentrating on God's promise that He will get glory to His name through the Church. It's a wonderful promise to know that right now, all over the world, there are people who are giving glory to God not just as isolated individuals struggling to follow Jesus on their own, but groups of people, companies of people, sometimes very, very large numbers of people gathering together, demonstrating that they love God, that they're serving Jesus Christ. And it's in these contexts that God is showing His glory. All over the world, people from different nations, different races, different backgrounds, are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the glory of God in the church. Now in recent programs, we've been looking at the words in the Bible that describe church. First of all, we looked at the word ecclesia, which means those who are gathered, gathered unto Jesus. We have been called out to gather together, to serve Jesus Christ together. And because we are gathered unto Him, in relationship with Him, then we are in relationship with one another. It's a supernatural relationship. It's not based on personal preferences or backgrounds or race or nationality. It's based on our relationship with Jesus Christ through faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we also began to look at the other word for church. It's the word koinonia. It's translated in the Bible translations as fellowship, but it really means those who are sharing together in partnership to fulfill a common purpose. And this means that the fellowship of God's people is the fellowship of those who've responded to the call of Jesus to give God glory through the name of Jesus Christ. And in the last program we began to look at the ways in which this word fellowship is used. We share together in worship. We share together as we pray together. We share together as we serve together. And in this way, we bring God glory. And at this particular point in the teaching, I'm going to say one or two more things about fellowship, how fellowship is expressed in our lives. And my prayer for you is that as we listen to today's teaching and as we watch it, God will speak to us and we will be drawn together as God's people more closely than ever before, that there will be a burden to love one another and to pray for one another and to encourage one another. So let's go right now straight into the teaching on fellowship and see how the Holy Spirit develops this fellowship. We're going to talk about the right hand of fellowship. In other words, how we extend love and partnership to one another in the body of Christ. I'd like to refer you to Galatians 2.29 just for an interesting thought in this context on the right hand of fellowship. James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Now, of course, the right hand of fellowship might just be a good old-fashioned hearty handshake. God bless you on your journey. But the link between fellowship and generous giving could suggest that that was more than a hand of fellowship, that there was something in that hand, there was something good to help them in the ministry. That's the kind of handshake we like in the ministry, isn't it? When somebody takes you by the hand and you shake their hand, and in the, in, in the handshake they communicate something good, a check or something that's helping you for your ministry or for your work. And so let's just bring this right down to earth. Fellowship is not this, this ethereal, airy-fairy kind of thing. Fellowship is practical. Fellowship is active, participating in the good things of God. Well, 
What then is the basis of our fellowship? Let me say, first of all, that fellowship is not something that we create by our actions or our attitudes. Of course, fellowship must be expressed through our attitudes and actions, but it's not created that way. Like ecclesia, we cannot create ecclesia. We cannot create church. We are made church by what God does to us, but we must express ecclesia. So it is with koinonia. We cannot create this. This is a work of the Spirit. God does it, but we are responsible for how we uh, uh, express it. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you see here the emphasis is on being called into this fellowship. We don't initiate this. God does it. God takes the divine initiative. And uh, I'm going to read a very, uh, very important passage in this respect, which will illustrate this very, very clearly. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. This passage is absolutely foundational for our understanding of fellowship. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, let me read those last two verses again and see if you can pick up the surprising change of words here, the surprising use of words. Verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, now what would you expect to read in verse 7 here, having read verse 6? Because he says, if you walk, if you claim to have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, you're a liar. But if you walk in the light, then you must have fellowship with him. You would expect him to say that, wouldn't you? But he doesn't. He says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So in John's mind here, you cannot separate fellowship with God from fellowship with one another. If you break fellowship with one another, you are breaking fellowship with God. Do you understand that? And this is something that the church of Jesus Christ has simply got to learn. We have got to understand that our fellowship is with the Father, with Jesus Christ, whom he sent, and in the Spirit, we are also in fellowship with one another. To break fellowship with one another is to break fellowship with God. The way you treat your brother is the way you are, in fact, treating God. So powerful is this fellowship, this relationship with each other. And what is a great tragedy is how Christians so glibly and so easily break fellowship with one another. And what is even more of an insult to the body of Christ and to Jesus, the head of the church, is that when they break fellowship with one another, they just go and form fellowship with somebody else, as if it were not part of the same body. Let me show you a ridiculous illustration. This hand says, I don't like this elbow. What a silly elbow. I'm falling out with the elbow. I don't want to be any part of this elbow at all. I'm leaving. So the hand severs fellowship. And just picture this grotesque picture. The hand creeps out on its own as if it can and says, I like this elbow. You see what you got? You got one arm 
with no hand, another arm with two. We call that the body of Christ. That's a monster. That's a Frankenstein freak. Hello? That's what we are doing to the body of Christ when we break fellowship with one another. One believer falls out with that believer, changes cell groups. I'm not coming to this cell group anymore. I'm going to be part of you. I'm going to be part of another cell group. Come on. Now, I'm not talking about people changing cell groups or changing churches and things like that, but the way it's done is so important. We cannot separate ourselves from one member of the body of Christ, let alone one expression of the body of Christ, and believe that in doing that, we are still expressing fellowship. My Father in heaven, what, what needs to happen to us that we repent of these ghastly sins in which we sever ourselves and dissect the body of Christ? Well, Romans eleven seventeen speaks about perhaps an even more neglected aspect of fellowship. Let me highlight it for you and anticipate something that I will cover in more detail in a later session. This is poetic language to show that us as Gentile believers, the majority of us are Gentiles, Gentile believers, we are partakers, we are partners of the Holy Root, who through the Son of God, of course, we know the Holy Root is Jesus, but we've been grafted into the olive tree, which is... Israel, the true Israel, whose root is Christ. Let's read it. Romans eleven seventeen. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. We being grafted in among them, and with them have been made a partaker of the root. This is, I think, highlighting a great sin in the church. The sin of anti-Semitism. The sin by which we forget our root in the remnant of the nation of Israel. The gospel is to the Jew first, also to the Greek. And I don't think that we will ever understand the depths of fellowship and the true nature of the church of Jesus Christ until we repent of the way in which we have treated the Jewish people, historically. Until we repent of our attitude even to modern Jewish people and to modern Jewish believers. Now we'll deal with this in a little later uh, a little session when we talk about the relationship between Israel and the church. But let's understand that fellowship means that we have been made partakers of the common wealth of Israel. And I'll explain what that means, in my understanding anyway, in a later session. Okay, so we fellowship together, and our fellowship is created, of course. The basis of the fellowship is our relationship with God. But we fellowship together through the Word. 1 John 1, verses 2 to 3. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. This is the Word, the living Word, that Word that was revealed. And so, through the revelation of the Word, fellowship was born. 1 John 5, verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true, and, that, and we are in Him who is true in His Son. This is true eternal life. The basis of our fellowship in the Word is not just intellectual agreement or intellectual understanding. It is participation through the anointing of God in the very life of God. And so the Word, the living Word, as well as the written Word is very important. When the more we share in the Word of God, the written Word, the personal Word, Jesus, the living Word of God, the more we share in every aspect of the Word, we are sharing together in fellowship. Our fellowship is through the cross. It's a cross-forged fellowship. Without the cross, there would be no fellowship. It's by the blood of Jesus that we've been brought near and made into the fellowship of God. In 1 John 1 verse 7, we read it earlier, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another 
and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. And so we need to know that our fellowship is created by the cross. The cross establishes the basis of our relationship with God, and therefore the cross also establishes the basis of our relationship with each other. Remember that it's the blood of Jesus which is the ground of all true fellowship. And so when you come to fellowship with one another, understand that the same blood that cleansed you is the blood that has cleansed your brothers and sisters. Now, one of the obstacles of fellowship is the faults we find in one another. God could make a very big obstacle between you and me if he chose. Between us and him, rather, if we chose. Couldn't he? And you and I could make great obstacles between our fellowship if we chose. All we'd have to do is look at one another's sins and faults and say, I can't fellowship with you. Now, does that sound familiar? All right. Now then remember, we wouldn't God, want God to treat us like that, to say, Colin, there's so much obstacles between you and me, that's it, we're through, we're finished. I'm not going to fellowship with you anymore. It's the blood of Jesus that removes those barriers, the blood that God has provided. Now it's the same for one another. Our fellowship is in the blood, in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood cleanses us from sin, and that's the basis of our fellowship. So remember, don't impose uh, obstacles on one another. Make sure that we see those obstacles washed away by the blood of Jesus. And of course, fellowship happens through the Spirit. He is the Spirit of fellowship. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We saw this in our Knowing the Spirit section in the Sword of the Spirit series. And the importance here is that the Spirit is the Spirit of fellowship. That is that's is what characterizes him. When Paul wants to describe characteristically what Jesus does, he says the grace of our Lord Jesus. When he wants to describe the characteristics of the Father, he says the love of God the Father. And he describes the characteristic of the Holy Spirit as being the spirit of fellowship. God fellowships with you by the Spirit, and we fellowship with one another also through the Holy Spirit. He creates fellowship. He sustains fellowship. The Holy Spirit enhances fellowship. So now we're going to see how fellowship is expressed. How we express fellowship. I've just gone through the scriptures to see how fellowship's expressed. It's illuminating. Let's have a look. We've seen also, first of all, that uh, believers express fellowship together. And I've already touched on Acts 2.42, which says that uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in the fellowship, meaning that the fellowship is an important part of our lives as Christians. That fellowship can only be expressed in the fellowship. This is not just informal fellowship, informal gatherings here and there, as beautiful as those are. We're talking about fellowshipping in the fellowship. That is the formally constituted fellowship, the body of Christ, to begin to anticipate some later teaching coming in this series. We've got to be clear about our identity, our purpose, and our function. And this can only be when we form church life, fellowship life. In other words, believers who are not part of local church life uh, people who are not fully participating in the fellowship, in the life of the expression of the church, then they are seriously remiss in their relationship with Christ. So too, congregations or fellowships that ignore other local expressions, other local churches, they are equally ne negligent. And so we've got to grasp this. We must be in the fellowship. In fellowship. What does that mean? To be in fellowship means you are a member of a church, that you are part of that church, and that you express your life as a believer in that church, through that church. Church hopping is not a New Testament thing. That is an invention of selfish, individualistic believers who fall out with one another too quickly and who do not want to be held to an account and who don't want to glorify God. Rebellious believers. That's not anybody here. Not anybody watching this, I'm sure. If you are out of fellowship, you don't have a local church, 
How can you possibly bring glory to God? You are to express fellowship in the fellowship. And you have to work hard at it. And it's hard. It's painful. But it's absolutely necessary. So the expression of this, let's see first of all, the Lord's Supper. It's called communion. It's called communion. The communion, the fellowship. It's God's ordained way of confirming our, our continuing fellowship. And there are scriptures there that you can look at. Giving to the needy, that's how we express fellowship. We've seen this already, anticipated it. Giving to the needy. Let's look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. Let them, he's commanding the rich, it's a rich man's Bible study, and he says, right, all you rich people, I'm giving you a Bible study, this is what you must do. Let them do good, let that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. This is talking about supporting and sharing with the poor, uh, giving to them. Also, it refers to supporting Christian ministries. We see this repeatedly, don't we? How that Christian ministries were supported. Philippians 1, verses 4 to 5, Paul is so grateful for the support of the Philippian believers. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay. Also, fellowship is expressed by enduring suffering together. We are sometimes called to suffer for Christ. And when we do this together and identify together and, and support those who are suffering, we are expressing fellowship in Christ. Look at this uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 7. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. So Paul says you are partaking of the sufferings of Christ and you are going to partake of the consolation. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. There, so what it's, God is saying here, that whatever affects your brothers affects you. Whatever happens to them happens to you because you are part of the same body. Now it's not surprising that the Apostle Paul himself should emphasize this so strongly in his epistles. Do you remember how he became a believer? He was on the road to Damascus. He had authority from the chief priests of Jerusalem to bring back and imprison those who were followers of Jesus. And yet Jesus appeared to him. And what did Jesus say? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul in that moment realized that as he persecuted believers... He was persecuting Jesus. It's not surprising that Paul should understand that believers are part of the body of Christ. Do you know this, my friends? What you do to your brothers and sisters, you do to Jesus. The way you speak to your brother is the way you speak to Jesus. The way you treat your sister, that's how you are treating Jesus. Jesus himself. Can you see how this concept of fellowship is so vital for us? We also see that fellowship means spreading the gospel. It's not surprising in the light of all that we've seen that fellowship would mean spreading the gospel because God wants this relationship to spread to the nations. 1 Peter, 1, 1 Peter 5 verse 1, Peter describes himself the elders who are among you, I exhort, who am also a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. If fellowship means partaking in the glory and we are companions together in that and that glory must be revealed, then surely, surely, fellowship will mean that we want to spread the gospel so that more glory comes to God and that others participate in us and with us. And so it means participating in evangelism. Now I say this because you see, there are, seems to me, two different kinds of people in the body of Christ. The evangelistic type and the fellowship type. There's some people who just want to sit together and have fellowship, have nice holy huddles. 
and huggies, the touchy-feely Christians. Then you've got those who are, who are the radical guys. They're out there on the streets evangelizing. They don't care what happens to the people once they get saved. As they, once they, they've got saved now. Where's the next person who needs Jesus? We need to understand that fellowship includes evangelism and that evangelism also includes fellowship. So we must see that if we are really, really want to be involved in fellowship, and to be truly the fellowship of God's people, we will proclaim him. That's the whole purpose of the proclamation, as we read in 1 John, where John says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, that we may have fellowship together. So the whole purpose of the proclamation is for fellowship. And the purpose of fellowship, surely, is that God's glory might be made known, which will presuppose an evangelistic emphasis. And so, the common purpose of our sharing together is not personal blessing. It is to share with others the good news of Jesus Christ and to see that glory revealed to the nations of the world. Well, here are some foundation statements regarding fellowship the fellowship of God's people. Let me remind you in conclusion that fellowship, koinonia, is a word that is on an equivalent basis to ecclesia, on an equal footing, these two words. Ecclesia, gathering, koinonia, fellowship. These two words are basic, fundamental descriptions of the church of Jesus Christ. The emphasis of gathering is on ecclesia, is, the emphasis of ecclesia is on gathering unto him. The emphasis on koinonia is sharing together in him. Gathering together unto him. Sharing together in him. That's the essence of the church. And it brings God glory. Amen. Well, we're going to come back after this session now, and the next session we're going to look at pictures of the church of Jesus Christ so that we can grow in our understanding of the church. God bless you till next time. That brings to an end today's teaching on glory in the church. And I pray that you've been blessed as you've been watching today's program and that you've discovered something new and fresh out of the scriptures concerning who we are as the people of God. We'll be back next time for more on glory in the church.